Okay, thanks a lot. Um, this is the first of, of three meetings that, um, slightly megamaniacally, um, I'm going to um, be, be doing around the general theme of the, the politics of Leninism. And I just want to say something about why we decided to have this, this, this course. And the, the answer is that, very clearly, we see a process of profound radicalisation going on in the world, world today. If we think of the 15th of May movement in Spain, the revolutions in the Arab world, the Occupy movement, the very intense class and battles that have been going on in Greece and so on, this represents a, a profound radicalisation which more and more is putting opposition to capitalism uh, on the agenda. Um, I mean, I was, I'm an obsessive reader of the Financial Times. Uh, today, they've got a whole series of articles about the banking crisis and the general, the strap, the the unifying theme is something like back to the crisis of capitalism. You know, in, in other words, even they have to admit that the question of capitalism is, is po posed as a political issue in a way in which it hasn't been for decades. So there's a process of radicalisation in which increasing numbers of people define themselves as anti-capitalist, as against the system. However, there's a limit to that radicalisation. Far fewer people um, will take the further step of saying that they're Leninists and of identifying specifically with the theory and practice represented by Lenin and, and the Bolsheviks. Now, this is different from part phases past phases of radicalisation. In the late 60s and early 1970s, the last time that we've seen so, saw such dramatic struggles and such a process of radicalisation, anyone who was seriously radicalised didn't just become an anti-capitalist, they joined some organisation that almost certainly saw, saw itself as, as Leninist. So there's a distinctive feature to the present radicalisation. Now, it's easy enough to understand why people don't uh, see it natural to become some kind of Leninist. Today, it reflects the experience of Stalinism, um, uh, dramatised by the collapse of the Soviet Union. You know, Leninism is about building a party and so on and so forth. Parties in general are very unpopular because of the, the kind of profound corruption of bourgeois democratic politics that we've seen in the neoliberal era, so people don't like parties, so why should they want to build a revolutionary party, and, and so on. It's quite understandable, therefore, that people um, don't think of Leninism as the natural terminus to becoming an anti-capitalist, but it's a weakness, it's a problem, it's a limitation in the radicalisation, and really what I want to do in these meetings is to explain why, why it's a... It's a, it's a limitation. Now, the, the, the title of this first meeting, The Primacy of Politics, may seem rather, rather strange. Um, um, you know, why talk about the primacy of politics, about Lenin, or indeed any other Marxist? But I wanted to start with the theme that more than anything else unifies Lenin's theory and practice. And that's not the question of the party. I mean, I think that if you look at Lenin's, if you look at Lenin's whole career as a revolutionary, the, the, you see how he develops a distinctive theory and practice of the of the revolutionary party. But it's not something that um, he himself is conscious of for a lot of the time. I mean, there's a major study of Lenin's what is to be done by the Canadian. Marxist Lars Lee, which shows that when Lenin wrote his famous pamphlet, What is to be Done, in 1902, which is generally identified as the beginning of Leninism, Lenin didn't think of, certainly didn't think of himself as a Leninist. He wasn't that big-headed apart from anything else. And he thought himself was simply stating what was the orthodoxy in the Second International, the International Socialist Movement of the day, when it came to um, the question of what kind of party um, uh, a revolutionary Marxist movement, um, rather confusingly in those days called the Social Democratic Movement, 
should try and build. So Lenin wasn't conscious that he was doing anything distinctive on the question of organisation. That doesn't mean that the question of organisation isn't critical to understanding Leninist politics, but it's not that that is really the unifying theme of his thought. I agree with two, um, two comrades um, in the Fourth International tradition, uh, the, the philosophers Michael Lurvey and Daniel Benside, when they say that actually it was a focus on politics and on the, the primacy of politics, that is, the, you know, if you go through all Lenin's works and so on, that is really the unifying theme. Now, that, that may seem a bit bizarre, because Lenin's a Marxist, and, you know, Marxism is about historical materialism, the, you know, the determination in whatever sense that's supposed to mean of social life by the forces and relations in, of production and the contradictions that develop between them. So what the hell is a Marxist talking about the, talking about the, the primacy of, of politics or having as the unifying theme of their thought the primacy of politics? One way of beginning to answer this question is to take a famous uh, um, remark of Lenin's that comes from quite late in his career, 1920-21, when there was a very intense debate in the Bolshevik party, by then, of course, in power, over the place of the trade unions in the Soviet state. And then he writes in one of the polemical texts he wrote that politics is the most concentrated expression of economics. And this is key. Politics is the most concentrated expression of economics. Now, there you see, reassuringly, that Lenin is a Marxist. You know, <laughs> politics is the expression of economics. But... The, there's that, there are those adjectives, the most concentrated expression of economics. Now, what, what is he saying when he says, says that? I mean, this is, a very, this is a very important idea. It's not, it's not unique to, um, to Lenin, incidentally. <coughs> Marx, particularly in his great um, economic manuscript, the, the Grundrisse, says something very similar a number of times. He talks about, for example, the concentration of the whole, by mean, which he means the totality of capitalism as a mode of production, but the concentration of the whole in the state. And it shows what a clever Marxist was, that Lenin came to the same kind of idea um, as Marx did, um, not through reading the Grundrisse, because the Grundrisse was published long after Lenin's death, but he converged on the same kind of idea. And it's crucial here that, that what Lenin, following Marx, is saying is, is that politics, the state, and I'm going to move between the terms politics and the state, I'm going to treat them as equivalent for these, these purposes, and there may be problems there, but that's what I'm going to do anyway. Bad luck. Um, politics, the state, arise from the fundamental contradiction between the forces and relations of production. Okay. But politics is the most concentrated expression of economics. I think what that means is that what Lenin is saying is all the multiple contradictions of capitalist society are concentrated and fused in the state, its structures, and the struggles, necessarily political struggles, that develop around, around the state. And I think that what that means is that, that, that because everything, all the conflicts and antagonisms of, of capitalist society are fused together in the, in the state, um, therefore politics itself has a logic, a way of working, that doesn't simply, in any mechanical or direct way, reflect what's, what's happening at the level of economy. You can't see what happens in politics as si simply uh, a window through which you can look through, and, you know, a window is, well, if it's not like my windows and it's clean properly, is something trans transparent that you can see through 
So you look through politics and you see what's happening in the economy. No, that's not what, 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 what is happening, Lenin suggests. In a certain way, politics acts in concentrating all the contradictions of capitalist society, acts as a distorting medium. Daniel Ben Said, who I've already, already referred to, says something interesting in his book on Marx. He compares Marx's political analysis to psychoanalysis. And what, I think what he has in mind here is Freud famously sees um, uh, sy symptoms uh, and also the, the, what, the chaos that we experience in, in dreams as a, a distorted expression of their real causes. In other words, the, that dreams and other, other sorts of symptoms both um, reflect their real causes, what are the deep-seated repressions and so on that are going on in the conscious, but they do in a way that systematically distorts um, the, the, the real causes. And what Ben Said is suggesting is that's true of politics. Politics um, represents the real causes, the conflicts of the level of production, but in a way that distorted, distorts what, what, what happens at the level of production. And therefore, political analysis involves trying to decode what's happening at the level of politics and read what's happening in politics in order to understand how it relates to the subterranean conflicts and antagonisms that define capitalism as, a, as an economic system. Now, one implication of this understanding of politics is, I think, that issues, political issues that don't directly reflect the conflict between capital and labour at the level of production may prove to be very important from the point of view of revolutionary political strategy. One very important example from the, the history of Bol Bol the Bolsheviks is the national question. The, the Tsarist Empire was, as I can't remember who said, a prison house of nationalities. It was founded on systematic oppression of the, the non-Russian na nationalities. And this generated all sorts of national movements and struggles and so, so on and so forth. Now, another great revolutionary, Rosa Luxemburg, said essentially that um, revolutionary Marxists had no interest in these national struggles. Apart from anything else, the nation state was economically obsolete because, you know, this is an anticipation of the globalization uh, analysis of, of re recent years. Because capitalism is a global system, every, every part of the globe is integrated and subordinated to the logic of capitalism as a global system, really, you know, what's the point in fighting for your own separate, separate nation, nation state and so on? And, you know, one crucial, and this is what Michael Lurvey uh, really emphasises when he discusses Marxism and the national question, one crucial thing that Lenin does is to say that this is completely wrong. If you're a revolutionary, then in Russia, then your focus is on developing the strongest possible struggle against the Tsarist state. And you want to do two things. You want to weaken the Tsarist state as... Um, as much as possible. And all sorts of different forces can be mobilised in order to weaken the state. Okay, the, I don't know, the Polish nationalists who Luxembourg was fighting politically, a petty bourgeois nationalist, you know, nothing to do with socialism, even though they talked a certain amount of social, socialist rhetoric, but nevertheless, the revolt of the Poles and of other oppressed nationalities can weaken the Tsarist state. The other reason why he thinks it's really important is that um, an effective revolutionary is an internationalist, is someone who opposes all forms of oppression. And if, as most Russian um, revolutionaries, so revolutionary socialists, Bolshe the Bolsheviks, etc., etc., um, you come from the dominant Russian nationality, then it's absolutely crucial that you break with your own nationalism by identifying with the struggles of the oppressed. So this is an illustration of how issues that clearly aren't sort of directly reflecting 
the contradictions of production and which may involve demands that, as Luxembourg argues, don't make sense in economic terms. She has all sorts of arguments about how Poland is economically integrated with Russia, so it doesn't make sense to separate them and so on. Actually, a bit like the arguments about Scotland, now that I come to think of it. But anyway, that's a, that may be a diversion or may not. But, you know, those aren't crucial. From the point of view of revolutionary strategy that is focused on the political struggle against the ruling class and their state, it's important to support the struggles for national, national self-determination. Georg Lukács, in his um, excellent, it's really a pamphlet, it's a sh very short book that he wrote um, soon after Lenin died, called Lenin, and it's really a, a sequel to his great philosophical work, History and Class Conscious, brings out this side of Lenin very, very, very well. I mean, it's, it's, it's famous that Lukács emphasises that central to the Marxist method is the focus on the totality. In other words, you understand capitalism, to put it in Marxist terms, as an organic whole. You understand how all the different, apparently fragmented and separate aspects of capitalism as a society, not just economic, but cultural, political, and so on, form an integrated totality defined by certain central contradictions. But in, in his book on Lenin, he takes that further and saying that, and this is, I'm going to develop this more in the ne next meeting I do, informing Lenin's political analysis is an understanding of the, of the imperialist system, the global imperialist system, as a, as a totality and a totality riven by contradictions, which may not, again, going back to what I just said, be in any straightforward way reducible to the contradiction between capital and, and wage labour. And he talks about Lenin being a practitioner of what he calls revolutionary realpolitik. And that's an interesting phrase. Realpolitik is, uh, well, it's a German word, Ah, that probably German comrades here, but um, who could translate it better? But what it really means is a realistic practice of the politics of power. That's what real politic means, uh, and it's associated with people like Bismarck and you know various um, ruling class statesmen of the, um, and they were, certainly were men of the um, the period before the First World War, and so on, so on and so forth. The idea of revolutionary real politics seems like a contradiction. How can a revolutionary practice real quality? And I think what Lukács is pointing to is the kind of method that Lenin pursues, of this rigorous focus on the way in which um, politics fuses all the contradictions of capitalism and may define as the central question something that's not immediately focused on the, on the, on the economic. Another example, a very famous example is Lenin's response to the Easter Rising in Dublin in, in 1916, where a big section of the Bolsheviks, who were influenced by Rosa Luxemburg, said these are just petty bourgeois nationalists with some romantic fantasy of an Irish Republic and things like that. They're nothing to do with the, the revolutionary socialist movement. And Lenin says, this is, what you're saying is nonsense. Uh, you're saying that how a revolution is going to work is one group of people line up over here and say, we are for imperialism, and another group of people line up over here and say, we are for socialism, and that's how a revolution will be. And he says, those who uh, dream of a pure revolution will never see it. In other words, real revolutionary processes come shaped by all the contradictions of capitalist, capitalist society. And the revolutionary, revolutionary real quality is looking at the ways of mobilizing the forces, the energies that are generated by those contradictions to destroy the system. And if that means petty bourgeois Irish nationalists, although we should never forget James Connolly, who was a working class revolutionary and one of the leaders of the East End Rising, but putting him aside for a minute, if that means that we 
look on as our allies, petty bourgeois nationalists, driving, trying to drive a dagger into the heart of the British Empire, the centre of global imperialism at the time, that's absolutely fine with, uh, with us. Okay, ten minutes left, oh dear. Okay. Um, right. Now, I think that that's all, you know, quite abstract and historical, but I think that what I'm talking about is absolutely relevant to the revolutionary experiences that we're going through at the present time. And of course, the central revolutionary experience, where it's not just taught to use the word revolution, is what's happening in, in, um, in, in Egypt. Because what we've seen in Egypt is um, the way in which the development of the workers' movement was crucial to creating the crisis that um, um, led to the, uh, the uprising of the 25th of January, but also the workers' movement then delivered the, the death blow to Mubarak, political death blow, that still hangs on to life feebly, unfortunately, um, the, um, by going on strike uh, in the days before he actually resigned on the, on the 11th of February. But it's an indication of what Lenin calls uneven development, the way in which the different contradictions of capitalist society don't just map onto each other and mirror each other, that since February 2011, the movement on the streets has developed much faster and in a much more self-consciously political way than the, the movement of the organised working class. The organised working class has also developed on a, on a very big scale, but it's not moved as quickly and as strongly as the movement, movement on, the, on the streets. Add to this that Egypt is a society with a very large rural population. And you can see from the election results in the legislative and presidential elections that the revolution hasn't really reached the countryside. The candidate who was closest to the revolution in the presidential election, Hamdine Sabahi, got a fantastic vote in the main urban working class areas. The countryside is a very different story where the candidates of SCAF, of the army, uh, and the Muslim Brotherhood uh, got, got, got much, much stronger su support. And an effective revolutionary intervention in Egypt means grasping the totality of the contradictions in, in Egyptian society. And that's, that's a complex task because a right-wing response to this situation might be to say, you know, the revolutionaries, the young working class activists who are the driving force in the fighting on the streets, the com confrontation with the riot police and so on and so forth, they must keep quiet, they mustn't make any trouble. You know, we must move slowly in order to win all, over the support of the peasantry. Now that's a, that's a strategy that would strangle, strangle the revolution. You can't shackle the vanguard, what is the vanguard of the revolution, to the most conservative um, elements in the society, or as yet the most conservative elements, the elements that haven't yet been won actively to participation in, in the revolution. So you can't hold back the most militant elements in that way, but what you should be trying to do is to orient the most militant elements to win the majority. Turning those absolutely heroic young activists to helping to build a much stronger workers' movement and on the basis of a much stronger workers' movement then to, to win the countryside and the smaller towns and villages and so on to the side, side of the re revolution. Now, if you think about the task of revolutionaries in Egypt in those terms, and in, in saying this, I'm echoing the kind of analyses that Lenin um, produces again and again in Russia between February and October 19, 1917, although it's a much more stretched out process chronologically in, in Egypt. If you think in those sorts, sorts of terms, then actually the electoral process becomes very, very important. Because here we, we're talking about the deep masses of Egypt moving into the political sphere in a society where elections have a be, been a complete fraud 
for the previous, well, more or less forever, but certainly since very limited forms of bourgeois democracy that existed in the British colonial period when you did a sort of contested elections and, and things, things like that. And for the masses, elections are important. Contested elections are an opportunity. Yeah. Um, and um, the revolutionaries had to relate to... Part of what I'm saying is the consciousness of different sections of the working class and the oppressed um, develops at different paces. And there's an enormous temptation, which has sometimes happened. We've seen, seen um, the revolutionary forces giving way to it in Egypt, um, really since last, last winter, <coughs> to draw the conclusion that because the, the, the revolutionary minority has seen through the electoral process, regards the generals as, uh, as, as their enemy, regards the Muslim Brotherhood as uh, at best a vacillating element, at worst part of the problem, than, pa than pa part of the revolutionary solution, that they don't need to be involved in the electoral process. Not forgetting the much broader masses for whom the electoral process is an opportunity to become involved in something like independent mass politics for the, for the, for the first time. Now these are of course questions that Lenin addresses very sharply in his uh, pamphlet Left-Wing Communism and Infantile Disorder. That's directed really to arguing with, in a way, the equivalent of the young revolutionaries of Egypt today, but on a Europe-wide scale, the hundreds of thousands of workers and of young intellectuals and so on who rallied to the cause of the Russian Revolution at the end of the First World War, participated, for example, in the German Revolution, in upheavals in different forms in Italy and Britain, all, all over Europe, to win that new vanguard that had emerged to an understanding that they're just a minority. They may have seen, he says, you may have seen through parliamentarianism. From your perspective and mine, parliamentarianism may be obsolete. But from the point of view of the large majority of the working class and other oppressed sections of society, parliamentarianism is, is a living reality, it's something they want to participate in, something that they haven't had enough of, and therefore revolutionaries can't abstain from participation in elections, intervening in elections, using the elections as a way of, um, um, a, a, a way of winning larger sections of the workers and the broader oppressed to the, to the revolutionary cause. And it's fascinating, if you look at Egypt today, to see the way in which, in, at certain moments, it's mirrored things that have happened, particularly in the German Revolution, the way in which the new German Communist Party, formed at the end of 1918, votes against the advice of Rosa Luxemburg to boycott the new elections to the Constituent Assembly, essentially surrendering the terrain to more right-wing forces who then have the legitimacy that comes from the electoral support that they, they've won. So the, 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 the way in which Lenin grapples with the implication of the fact that politics is, is, is central in, informs many of the crucial interventions and debates that he uh, found himself involved from very early the very early stages of the development of the Russian Marxist movement through to, um, for example, the German Revolution, which unfolded in, in Lenin's last years of life and uh, last years as a, as a, as a, as a political, political activist. And these aren't just, you know, dry, dead historical experiences. They're experiences of living importance to revolutionaries today. How Lenin grabbed grappled with these problems, not just Lenin, but I focus on Lenin because he was so much the, the clearest and expressed so well the, the implications of the kind of approach that I'm trying to, trying to, to, to spell out. What they grappled with can 
hope to inform um, and illuminate the kind of dilemmas faced by the revolutionaries of, of today. And as I say, when I say revolutionaries, well, no, I haven't said it, but you know, I'm not simply talking about revolutionaries in the sense I'm a member of the Socialist Workers' Party, I want to see world social, socialist revolution, all of which is true, but revolutionaries in the sense of people fighting in the streets and in the workplaces in Egypt as part of a real revolutionary process that faces life and death choices. And I think the kind of method that Lenin develops, which I try to out outline, is of, of relevance to what they're trying to do. Now, I'm going to try and show the connection between the method that I've attempted to outline to sketch out now um, to both Lenin's um, distinctive analysis of, of capitalism and to the question of the party in the subsequent two sessions. But I think having an understanding of the particular conception of politics that Lenin has and how that informs his approach to concrete political questions is very, very important in grasping these other questions and in grasping what unifies Lenin's method as a revolutionary and makes what he says relevant to us today. And I'll shut up. It seems to me that one of the... Uh, it's, not, it's not a disagreement with Alex, it's something to add in a sense. That part of the argument for the primacy of politics is an argument against the particular view of Marxism, which is most often held by our opponent. And that is that Marxism is a theory of determinism. That essentially what happens in history is the product of large social forces um, and really that individual um, groups making decisions are not as important as the great sweep of history. And it seems to me that Lenin's politics stand against that and say that what people say and what they do in particular organisations and in particular moments matter a lot in terms of what's going to happen. And Lukács in, Alex referred to Lukács, there's a book which Lukács wrote, I think in 2025, uh, 1925, sorry, um, which was a defense of history and class consciousness. And he has a very interesting discussion there with two people that he identifies as Mensheviks. Um, I think actually they were uh, members of the Communist International, but he calls them a Menshevik tendency. And they have tried to explain the failure of the Hungarian Revolution of 1919 in terms of that forces have not sufficiently accumulated for the revolution to succeed. The big historical forces. And Lukács' reply to them was essentially, I'm inventing words for him, but no comments, that's not the reason, we blew it. Okay, we, the Communist Party in Hungary, got it wrong. We didn't act in the right way and that is why we lost. And that's a quite different reason. That means that what we as the communists did and said in a particular moment mattered. In, and the, the appeal of a deterministic kind of theory of history is not just something which is characteristic of would-be Marxists. There are some people who... It's actually the characteristic of quite a lot of people who hold to spontaneous and autonomous positions on politics who say it doesn't matter in the long run whether or not you're organising parties. In fact, it's probably an impediment. What matters is whether or not people spontaneously, and what does spontaneity mean? Some force acting outside them, in a sense, change. And that seems to me a politics of despair, the politics in the end that leads uh, John Holloway, for example, to say we should change the world without taking power. And I look back at the history of solidarity in Poland, the most impressive workers' movement we've seen in Europe since the war, and they said we must change the world without taking power, in other words, without confronting the state, and they, in the process they demobilised their own members and let, them mem let the state defeat them. And it's a you know, if you want to follow Holloway's position, you end up like the leaders of solidarity in a Stalinist prison. That's, that, that's the logic of his politics. And the last, I think I've probably run out of time, have I? Right, I'll shut up. I'm like Colin, I don't want to disagree with Alex. I think there's a very serious either misinterpretation or misunderstanding here or something even perhaps quite dangerous and sinister. Let me try it out on you. Uh, 
I think a key text is about where it comes from, where I come from. If you read IS J133, Alex is the editor, he wrote the introduction. Our pages, I'm sorry, I forgot my glasses, I'm going to have to do. Well, anyway, very, very early on in the introduction, he uh, subtitles the section Egypt, the Revolution in Balance. Uh, and he refers, end of the second paragraph, as Alexander says elsewhere, this journal, etc., this is due to the enormously poor by the Revolutionary Workers' Movement in uh, August and September. But, Alexander interjects, as Lenin wrote long ago, politics is the most concentrated expression of economics. This does not mean, notice, this does not mean that what happens in the political field simply reflects the unfolding of the economic class struggle, which is true, as long as that word simply is, is understood as we do. Then, however, he starts by quoting Daniel Van Saeed. Why quote Daniel Van Saeed, Alex? This man. I was in the IMG when I was misguided in teenage before I realised a lot of centuries rubbish. Right? These are the people who went around calling Stalin's Russia a worker's state. It degenerated a bit deep form. But they were completely wrong. They've been centuries for 40 years or 50 years. Right? Ben Saeed has opposed them, revised them, falsified them, and misinterpreted them for the best half of a century. Why am I quoting from Ben Saeed at this point? Why not Cliff? Cliff's three volume work on them is excellent. You, you make it absolutely clear, right, that, you know, there's a danger here of squeezing out something else with this phrase primacy of politics. To the working class and even our own party, when we have established theories which everybody knows reflecting the uh, revolution, uh, you know, state capitalism, etc., etc. This is new, this is brand new. We've got to be really careful where we're going with this. But it sounds like it's trying to replace something else that's got the primacy and the centrality. The centrality of the working class, the cliff summarised Marxism as. If you, if you rule out the economics, right, be careful what this means. You rule out historical materialism, which says the first thing in normal life, before everything else, is human beings must feed, clothe, and shelter themselves. That's production. Economics. Right? Now, the two comrades, I think, this impacts the last sentence, was uh, Hossam Arabi and, um, and Alexander, who I think, you know, with all respect to us, Alex, I'm better qualified than anybody in this party to comment on Egypt in an excellent meeting this morning, pointed out that the struggles are, like Rosa Luxemburg said, quite often economic, more often, in fact, than political. And that is the stage of the revolution we're at in Egypt today. Therefore, I say, because Anne, Anne was really badly off form, Anne's a brilliant writer, actually, she's a peerless writer of revolution in our party, for simple reasons, she's right next to it in Egypt. And so is Lossat, who, who lives there and has been there for years, uh, in uh, uh, Malala. I think we be very careful, guys. We can't throw out the economic uh, bathwater. Right? We've got to hold on to that as central, because the workers are central to our project. The primacy of anything is the working class, the centrality of the working class. Um, I feel I should come back on that. Um, anyone that's been to a picket line will know the conversation you, you get when you get into what well, sometimes seems like the internal detail of the specifics of the strike and the particular characters of the manager you're dealing with. Now that's all well and good, but you also know that this is going nowhere until you begin to expand the issue, and then until you begin to generalise why it's not just my boss who is a swine, but all bosses are swines, and why they're particularly doing it in this situation the neoliberal assault and so on. And unless that is expanded, those conversations become a dead end. And they become, a de they become I think they become, they're interesting, but they, without generalising, people don't become socialists. And there's, I don't know, I was brought up with Cliff quoting all the time, um, Lenin, um, we have to be tributes of the press and, and not simply syndicalists or e e economic, reflecting economics, you have to broaden the thing. Unless you broaden the thing, then you don't become, you don't go bond to strike to, to, to general political questions that can, can transform the whole situation beyond the strike. argument with the, the speaker last but one. But I think it's incredibly important that uh, we defend in it probably 90 odd percent of what Alex said and recognise that there are incredibly important uh, insights beyond our tradition 
you know, I mean, Alex quoted Laz Lee's book on Lenin. You know, there's a lot of people outside the tradition uh, who have written on Lenin and Trotsky and whoever else uh, from whom we need to read and we need to learn. Uh, and I remember reading this, uh, the, the Lowy uh, uh, article in terms of the defense of the primacy of politics many years ago. And it's an incredibly important and impressive argument. Why is it an important and impressive argument? Because, I mean, comrades must, I mean, I have people at work who will say to me things like, we don't need to take, you know, you don't need to bring up the issue of uh, Islam, uh, of fighting, because it's got nothing to do with class. You know, you don't need to take, bring up the issue of uh, women's oppression, gay rights, because it's got nothing to do with class. And actually, it becomes an incredibly reactionary argument to sit there and to, uh, to talk at that level. What we need to be doing is talking about how do we win over and create the working class as this real universal class that offers an alternative uh, to, the, uh, to the system as a systematic, uh, a systematic alternative as a totality. And on one side of that, you're talking about winning uh, unity within the working class and winning leadership within other groups that are fighting capitalism for the working class within that struggle. And that means not simply reducing everything to the question of economics. And then in terms of, and this is where Colin's absolutely right, to the criticisms of Holloway and, and such like, and then looking at the state as the key structure that fixes and maintains capitalist relations of production, and we ask ourselves, how do we break it? If we want liberation, we have got to break that through the unity of our side. And that's a political argument. I think there are some slight weaknesses with the way Alex formulated the relationship between one and other. But they are very little weaknesses in comparison to the other alternative, which is incredibly dangerous uh, to move in that direction and just say, you know, using pseudo-radical language about the centrality of the working class and the centrality of uh, economic issues that actually can lead to very, very dangerous and reactionary conclusions. Yeah, Alex mentioned perhaps the, the classic example from uh, Michel Levy about the national question, which illustrates how a certain view of Marxism and of class struggle, of simply being the economic struggle over the surplus value between workers and capitalists, that that's a view that that is all that Marxism about is about, that is all that the class struggle is about. In fact, leads not to just a mistake, but to a diametrically opposed position when it comes to real struggles taking place which could weaken the capitalist state, which uh, others have to, with which uh, revolutionists, Marxists, wish to act in, act in solidarity. I think what Paul just said uh, under, underlines that. To say that Polish workers are workers, Russian workers are workers, and we're all against the bosses, when one country is held in subordination to another, and the Russian workers hold ideas about Polish workers, which identifies the Polish workers as the enemy and not the Russian bosses, is not a revolutionary position. It's an adaptation to the two end politics, because the politics exists whether you decide to say that politics is private, it, it, it isn't the uh, sense of what you're doing or not. Politics exists because capitalism produces a politics and an ideology and so on. The second point I just wanted to raise and ask uh, uh, Alex to comment on is I think in another sense, Lenin was talking about the privacy of politics. In that, uh, Engels had a famous formulation which is that there are three arenas, if you like, three layers, uh, planes of the class struggle. Economic struggle, direct struggle between workers and the bosses, an ideological struggle, a struggle for a different set of ideas in society, a struggle against uh, ideologies which confuse and mystify the way the system works, and he also said a political struggle. And I think sometimes that gets collapsed down into just those two an ideological struggle and an economic struggle. What Lenin restated was that political crises happen, political questions come up should there be peace or war? Uh, what the form of voting should be, uh, what's happening in a scandal inside a, even a bourgeois uh, party or amongst the Murdoch, uh, with the Murdoch Empire and so on. And that these have their own distinct dynamic which is not reducible to do you go on strike or do you say that socialism is better than capitalism? They generate forms of struggle, they generate questions which are not reducible to either, which if you want to change the world you have to intervene in because sometimes that might be the most, be the most concentrated 
question on uh, on people's mind. And in that sense, what I think Lenin did, the Bolsheviks did, this idea of the privacy in politics was move beyond what already existed, which is plenty of people who supported workers' struggle, and plenty of people who said that capitalism was bad, to a method and approach which was identifying the weak points of the system in order to overthrow it. Yeah, sorry, I'm going to apologise to Alex, because actually came in late, so I didn't hear the beginning of the, um, of the talk. And I just wanted to come back a little bit on the comments of the comrade who was referring to the meeting I gave this morning, because I don't think that there is a great deal of disagreement between what I was saying and what Alex was saying. I think if that's what came across, that was um, misunderstanding, I think, the point I was trying to make in the meeting, where I talked about how you can see, yes, processes that, that push towards the unity of the political and social aspects of the revolution, but that you can also see the things that push it apart and the separation, that what is required is an organisation of people in the workplace who strive to overcome that gap and that distance between the political and the social. And actually, as, uh, as Alex was arguing, put those political questions in the workplace, at the heart of it. So I spent a long time talking about why it is, in, in my view, absolutely crucial to win the layer of people in the working class in Egypt, the idea that in the workplaces they must stand up over the question of sectarianism against the Coptic Christians, for example. They must take up political arguments about the dissolution of parliament and about and not simply the question of, uh, of, of the next strike. Because what we've seen over the last year in Egypt has been continuation of these massive waves of strikes. And in some, in some of these strikes, very directly political questions are raised in the sense of for example, confronting the generals who are running a particular workplace, the airport workers in Cairo Airport. Fantastically, political strikes, political campaigns around this issue. The problem is, there is also a very strong tendency within the leadership of the independent unions in particular to argue that you have to separate economic and political questions and that they should not discuss political questions in the context of trade unionism. Which, to my mind, in the context where you have a counter-revolution forming, an Ahmed Shafiq you know, at this point, when I saw these people like Kamala Wright was arguing with, this, with them three weeks ago, Ahmed Shafiq looked like he might well be the next president of Egypt. And the idea that you could say that this will protect you somehow, saying, I'm just a trade unionist. Don't attack me. Don't close down my independent unions. I, I, I don't talk about polit political questions as if this would be some kind of protection. And worse than that, actually, of course, it actually weakens the relationship between the organised working class and the activists in the streets. And what is really ironic about the situation is that there are hundreds of thousands of people in Egypt who are leading these strikes, who are actually also after work. They go down to the squares and they're in the streets. They have huge expectations that the movement is going, is going to continue, but they don't see that what they do in the workplaces can overcome that. And that, to me, is a political question. It requires building a political organisation of revolutionaries who will carry that through, will overcome the division between the political and the social within their own souls and actually need it. That has to be also the leadership of this. The, it's the concept of the revolutionary in the workplace as being part, it's like the working class as being the revolutionary leaders of the people against the, against the bourgeoisie. And that's the, so I think most of the time I'm talking about Lenin's state of revolution and what is to be done. This is not by any means to say that I don't find what Roxanne Rosa Luxemburg wrote important and very, and very, very useful. But I think it's a misunderstanding of what I was trying to say is to put it in some kind of opposition to what Alex was saying. I mean, maybe there, if I heard the rest of the talk, there would be things that we might have slightly different positions on, but I, I felt it was very counterposed in a way that was not coming across as what I meant. Uh, listening to Colin Barker, I remember, I remember the, uh, John Holloway's speech in March of 2009 here in London. It was uh, after the December 2008 uprising, youth rebellion in Greece, and John Holloway follows Greek politics. So he gave a speech, and instead of uh, giving any other argument, he gave, he gave a story about the park, the park in Navarino. It's a park which uh, the people who live in a progressive area in, uh, in exactly the center of Athens turned into a, a very nice, it was a parking. And they turned it into a park, a very nice park. They, uh, they planted some trees. It was fantastic. He said that this is it. This is the way. You can have, you can resist the temptation to deal with the state. You can have cracks in capitalism, 
but it's better than doing than giving an overall political response to uh, 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 instead of doing anything else. Well, it, it was 2009, and now it's 2012. Now we have had a sequence of, uh, of working class rebellion, of strikes, of, of big movement, and now the big news from Greece is not the self-organization of the park. Now the big news from Greece is people voting for the left to govern. For, for what the whole, the whole movement for, for where the society is going to move. And it is very important because lots of people who were excited by this stuff, who were skeptical about the notion of the party, of the state, like Alain Badiou, he signed a letter saying that everyone should vote for, for Syriza. Even people who are hardcore anarchists, who participated in this part, voted for Syriza, comrades. And what does that show us? It shows that working, where the working class moves, it changes everything. But apart from that, I want to say something else. Some hundred meters away from this square, from the square is already, there's another square for it. It was the square of Agios Pantelimonas. It's less known. It was the square that the fascists targeted. They started, they, they, they started hitting immigrants. They started to cleanse it from, uh, from anyone who was a foil. They built on that, and they were able to have this uh, horrible uh, electoral result with 7% in the, in the last elections. So what people learned from their experience in Greece is that you're not alone. That there are other so social and political fo forces who take initiatives. And it's not what you do in your park. It's not what you do in your struggle. It's, especially in times of crisis. You, you, have, you, have, you have the big questions arising of where the society is going. So you need to answer to these political questions. So we tell to all the young people, especially the young activists, who participate in the movements and who experience the, the beginning of the movement, which is, also, which is always an anti-political moment, which is the moment where everyone is together, where everyone is fighting, and tell them, we understand why sometimes you are anti-political in the beginning, but don't lose time in the anti-political moment. If, the, if your movement will be big and strong, it will need to, to answer to all the big political questions. And the big political question is not politics or not politics, it's what kind of politics. Can we invent the kind of politics which is not just take the government under the capitalist rule, but overthrow the state through working class activity? Whether there can be a dilemma which is much better than apolitical movementism or political reformism. And we say that there is much better politics, right? it's revolutionary social politics, and this is what we need to get people uh, uh, with us in, uh, in, this, in, the, in, the, in the fight ahead.
My name is Candice Boomer, I'm a GP in Tahannes. For the first time in my life, about two weeks ago, I took a day of industrial action. <laughs> <laughs> The action was actually very patchy amongst doctors up and down the country. Uh, and it's important to try and approach this debate. We've had it approached from the big picture in Egypt, but also just from the small picture about why in some parts of the country, like where I work in Tahamets, very large numbers of doctors took part. And a few yards down the road, St. Islington, there was only one GP practice that took part in the action. And I think that that actually relates to the question of politics and how that is how that came into the heads of the doctors who didn't, didn't participate. The BMA leadership argued for the strike in terms purely of the economics. That you know why should we pay 14% of our, our income in, in pension contributions and judges who are on the same kind of uh, some of them on the probably higher salaries pay a much smaller amount and uh, 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 MPs pay a much smaller percentage for the same level of pension. Uh, so that kind of analysis made a lot of doctors up and down the country feel, well, we're well paid, you know, they were, they were subject to all the criticism of the Daily Mail. Whereas in town Hamlets, we've got a different tradition that, that um, uh, the activists, the socialists, the revolutionaries amongst us in, in the borough have actually worked out. We've become involved in the keep our NHS public campaign, we've become involved in stopping the NHS building crimes, as we've joined in on November the 30th with all the other, uh, other workers who were in action. And people had a broader conception of politics. They understood the connections. We'd had the debates about the bankers in Canary Wharf, going around the GP email lists, about you know, those sorts of debates have been, have been raised. And as a consequence, you know, more than half of the, the practices uh, became involved. So I think that if you, if you you need to look at all this in terms of what is the relationship between ideas and people's heads and the economic reality that they're facing. And if you only look at it in terms of what is the economics of the situation, then that in the end it might lead to bursts of industrial activity, but in the end it will lead to political passivity. And unless we have political consciousness, people understand the connections between all aspects of the struggle, we can't take the revolution for further boys. Kevin mentioned uh, Engels' formulation of three components of the class struggle, the uh, industrial, the economic, the ideological, and the political. Uh, and there is uh, a, a tradition going a long way back that I, I want to talk about sort of, you know, just before the First World War when syndicalism, uh, trade union, you know, struggle for economic uh, demands was very, very big in, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a movement. In, in America, the industrial workers of the world, the IWW, had a leader, uh, Bill Hayward, uh, and he had a formulation, and he, he used to say that he, put, he kept his union card in his wallet, but his Socialist Party card in his top pocket. And in a sense, really, what, 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 that, what, it, what it was about was Monday to Friday, it was trade union struggle, it was economic struggle, but at the weekend, political questions were discussed. Similar things happened with uh, uh, syndicalists in, in Scotland, I understand. And so, what, what broke the very, very strong trade union movement in America was the First World War. Most of the, uh, of the members of the IWW were opposed to the war, but they never brought it up in the union meeting. There was many women involved in, uh, in those economic struggles and strikes, but they didn't mention the demand for women's rights or against women's oppression in the union branch. It might be divisive. Those sorts of things were discussed separately at the weekend. And so, you, you know, it, economics, it's, I disagree with, I think it was the second speaker, it's not just about economics, because economics comes up very, very quickly against political questions because of the state. And I'm just thinking of just two examples, because most of the discussion has been about elsewhere and in other historical periods. They're fighting on the buses for a £500 bonus, and a judge comes along and says, you strikes out of order, you can't do it. Politics comes in straight away. Even when the students were marching, say, we don't want fees, economic question, we don't want the EMA, economic question. They get battered by the police, kettled and, and all the rest of it, and it becomes a political question about police violence, about whether you're right to fight back or not. 
And that's why uh, I think Anne Alexander mentioned the necessity of bringing political questions into the workplace, into the union, as part of our tradition and our routine. And it seems to me that that is the primacy of politics, and that's what Leninism is all about. Um, I just wanted to say also that we have to be very careful about being economistic, because our rulers at the moment certainly are not economistic. And the depth of the crisis that exists, you know, the logical economic thing would be to maybe let lots of the companies and the banks go to the wall. But actually, politically, they know that that's much too dangerous. And so they're actually caught in a situation where they're not actually necessarily acting in their best economic interest, because actually austerity is a political thing. And if it were to be... Uh, their, their logic of doing austerity might is actually, as we can see, actually against the, uh, the idea of getting the economy going. So sometimes, even they are in a situation where they're not able to act in the economic interests of capitalism. For example, after the 1929 crash, the fact that everything was let to the wall, many people, they, they believe today that that is too dangerous, and instead of letting that happen, they're propping up the system all the time, which in itself, it in turn, generates a whole lot of contradictions as well. So I think it's precisely the fact that they're not acting necessarily logically and rationally in the interests of the economic system that opens up the space politically to challenge them. I think that's really important. Just the second thing is that I really don't think, and somebody sort of mentioned you know, Ben Said in a sort of very sectarian kind of way, I really think in this period, the idea that we have the holy grail of truth on everything not only goes against our practice every day, where we're finding that all sorts of people are fighting back way before sometimes even revolutionaries, but particularly in the case of somebody like Ben Said, who anybody who's read his book, Marx for Our Times, it's the most topical thing to read. It, 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 goes, it, it, it raises a whole lot of questions that you get from the right about the nature of class in society, he has a whole section on how the white-collar workers are actually part of the working class. And the idea that somehow we can dismiss this guy, this guy has contributed, and indeed his organization, although it's in a difficult situation at the moment, is part of the revolutionary movement. And surely, if we learn anything in the present period, it's that actually we have to build bridges with a whole section of people on the left, and indeed beyond that. And the idea, I think, so therefore, at the moment, if we're going to be really sectarian, it's totally counterproductive. It's not going to be able to seize on the weakness of our rulers. And quite apart from anything else, it's not how anybody comes to politics in the beginning. I think um, what I find most attractive about the idea that Alex uh, spelled out is the total rejection of the characterisation of Marxism as an economically deterministic philosophy, i.e. the idea that the world moves through certain stages characterised by the mode of production, and that the types of struggle that one can wage are limited to precisely to the boundaries of that economic, that economic system. You know, that's the, the, you know, if you're taught basic Marxism, that's the kind of thing that you're likely to, talk, to be taught. This notion that Lenin stands for the primacy of politics turns that really on its head and says that the economics provides a crucial context, but what happens within that context reflects a number of different struggles that, that, that go on. I find that very attractive. And it points to one of the great weaknesses of the determinist theory as being the attitude to the national question. And I'd like to say I think that that, that, that weakness uh, of, of that approach in Marxism has really damaged the Marxist movement over, over the last century. If you think about a country like India, Mass Communist Party formed in India in the 1920s, at first made the assumption that India was too economically backward to achieve socialism, and that therefore any struggle that, that went on uh, within the context of India under British rule must be limited to a struggle, a bourgeois struggle for national liberation. And then makes another turn, based on an equally deterministic uh, 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 reading of the situation, which says that if a new bought living, this is some years later, if a, a bourgeois India is born, then who takes control of the state, the rich Indian, new Indian uh, uh, ruling class, 
Therefore, workers have no interest in being a part of the national struggle whatsoever. We might as well just allow the bosses to get on with it. And that's a, a complete abstinence of the communists from the national movement for a whole period of time, for which they were to pay, pay absolutely dearly. So this idea that the world kind of moves on, irrespective, because it's determined by forces which are essentially out of our control, is a characterisation of Marxism that I think is a million miles away from any kind of living Marxism. We've talked about an engagement with the contradictions that are thrown up and a way which we can both exploit in order to try and break the hold of those conditions which are, which are, which are binding by, by us at that time. Thank you. That's a really interesting talk. I think two things I'd say. I think in Britain, our kind of our Marxism is relatively, I would say relatively impoverished in that it isn't located in a central philosophical tradition as in uh, France and Germany, which is hospitable to uh, the Marxist, the Hegelian Marxist line. And I think Ben Said is located differently to our, you know, our own rather more shallow stream. And um, one thing about Western Marxism is it has actually, for several decades now, addressed the interface between Marxism and Freudianism. And the Ben Said notion also is in Althusser, where the relationship between base and superstructure is um, related to the way symptoms are formed in dreams. And that comes through Lacan. And it's about over-determination. But I won't go down that road because it might upset some people. But I do know that Alex wrote a book which I read about 35 years ago when Althusser was a great puzzle to students like me, and it was extremely helpful <laughs> long time ago, and that was before Mr. Edward Thompson got his pen out. Anyway, the other, the other thing I'll say is a very, very personal thing. My granny was arrested for shouting, we want Soviets from the visitors' gallery in 1919, when they were discussing sending arms to the whites. And she was a sister, I use that in a feminist sense, a sister and a comrade of Sylvia Pankhurst, who at that time had changed the name of her women's magazine from the Women's Dreadnought to the Workers' Dreadnought and was communist or forming a communist project, and she went, Sylvia did, not my great granny, went to Moscow to see Lenin for the international, and came back for the flea maria, and the work that was written was left-wing communism, an infantile disorder, and it was urging British revolutionaries to get involved with the labor movement and not to wait for a cataclysm that he knew, Lenin knew, wasn't going to happen here unless people got involved and that meant working with reformists. Okay, thanks. Um, it, it seems to me that if the Socialist Workers' Party and other organisations are in it. Leninist interventionist organisations, and it seems to me to be absolutely essential. But what we attempt to do is integrate, not just see things as separate, integrate the economic struggle, the political struggle, and the ideological struggle. And I think that this is a very, very practical question. If you want to see a million people on a demonstration in London on October the 20th, you cannot just approach it on one single level. The argument that's taking place in the North East, and I'm sure everywhere else, is between those activists and those militants who do want to see that, and certain sections of the trade union movement, because of their tie-in with the political organisations like the Labour Party, 
are putting a limit and a block on the numbers of people that they want to see turning up. You also need to take into account that we do not want to see just trade union activists, we don't want to see just the trade union committee members, we want to see pensioners and students and people from disabled groups, organisations and tenants associations and people defending their local hospital. In other words, we want to see an integration of all the people who are engaged in a struggle against this rotten Tory government. We want to see it pushing further, further beyond just the fight for the Tory government. And you have to see it as a totality and a rounded kind of a, a, a project. Otherwise, what you end up with is a division, which is the worst thing that we need under these present uh, circumstances. So it seems to me that the, the kind of thing that's been talked about is to do with this very idea of seeing the system in its totality and recognising that there's lots and lots and lots of people who've got lots and lots of different reasons for wanting to shock the Tories. If we, if we take that into account, it means that we can have the big demonstrations and we can move beyond the demonstrations on the streets into the fight, into the workplace, into the, struggle, the economic struggles and then back again. This idea of moving between politics, economics and, and ideology is not an abstract argument. It's precisely what a Leninist organisation should be doing. It's precisely what an interventionist organisation should be doing. These are very, very practical conclusions from this kind of you know, theoretical debate we're having, we're having here. Everybody should be working very hard towards that, having that mass demonstration, but it means integrating all these things together because it's the reformists who want to see the separation of politics and economics because they're, that's precisely if they don't want to see our class taking hold of, in the end, the, the uh, economy and they, they want to see that sort of uh, separation. We have to fight, fight against it. It's a very, very practical problem as far as I can see. Okay, thanks very much. Very interesting discussion. Um, I, I take what Gwyn Jones says in criticising me very seriously. Comrades may not know Gwyn, but when the uh, Romanian Revolution broke out in December 1989, he rushed off to Bucharest to be part of the revolution and try to win some of the activists involved in the, the revolution uh, to a proper understanding of, of socialism from below, which was an immensely brave and adventurous thing to do. And he spent a number of years building the IS tendency in, in Eastern Europe. So he's, you know, like the Egyptian comrades, he's someone who's been part of a real revolution. So when he calls me to order, I take what he says so seriously. Um, but I, I mean, let me just say on the question of economics, I mean, I am totally obsessed with the economic crisis. Obsessed to the, the point of near insanity. And that comes over, I think, if you look at international socialism and the, you know, the possibly over-detailed analysis of the crisis that you find in its pages, often written by me. So it's not, I promise you, Green, I, I haven't forgotten about the economy, you know, I'm, I still, you know, historical materialism and the critique of political economy, that's, you know, that's very central to, uh, to my world, world view. Um, but I, um, I, I think that, and I'm prepared to accept that in talking about primacy of, of politics, there's an element of, of provocation. Um, you know, I am bending the stick, and, uh, which is a practice not unknown in the history of the SWP, <laughs> it has to be said. said. Um, and maybe that's why, I mean, I wish Paul Blackledge had said, you know, he said he agreed with 90% of what I'd said. I'd like to know what the 10% was, but, you know, that'll be for the power afterwards. But, um, but there was an element of polemical exaggeration in the emphasis in which I put. Uh, and I, I, the reason why really was to do with the development of the Egyptian Revolution. Because, um, you know, if you look at how things develop immediately a fall after the fall of Mubarak, you have not simply the strikes that helped to bring him down, that played a crucial role in building down, but you see the workers' movement taking giant steps forward in the su subsequent months, the formation of uh, a federation of independent trade unions, uh, a fantastically important strike by the teachers in, I think it was August last year, and so on. These are very, very important developments. You, know, you have a sense of the working class beginning to give itself an organised form, 
which had been impossible under Mubarak, and to flex its muscles. The problem, you know, and all that was fantastic, and, you know, I, like lots of other commas, were absolutely fixated on what was happening in the workers' movement. Then you have the crisis at the end of 2011, in November and December, these massive street confrontations, very bloody confrontations between the street activists, who, it has to be emphasised, are working class. They may not necessarily be working in factories, they may not have jobs, but they're part of the broader Egyptian working class. Or the idea that, you know, the youth who fight the cops on the streets in Cairo, Alexandria and so on are, you know, refined, um, you know, graduates of the American University of Cairo and, and, and you know, on, the, um, on Facebook all the time is, is, is nonsense. This is, you know, we're talking about a section of the working class, but precisely a section of the working class not organised in the workplaces, <coughs> taking place, uh, t- uh, taking part in a mass political confrontation with, with SCAF, with the, with the military and their rep- repressive agents. And that's the focus of the, the revolutionary movement. When the Federation of Independent Trade Unions tries to give its support to the, the movement on the, on the streets, tries to, you know, the, the leadership calls their members to join the, the fighting on the streets, hardly any t- uh, took, took part. When the Federation of Independent Trade Unions with the support of, of um, the revolutionary left, called a general strike in February, essentially directed at SCAF, it was a flop. In other words, there's a process of uh, an uneven development, central concept of Lenin's after all, within the revolutionary movement in Egypt, in which the, the movement on the streets is developing more rapidly than the movement in the workplaces, which is not to say that there aren't all sorts of connections between the two, and they're very powerful economic driving forces behind everything that's ha- happening in, in Egypt. But that uneven development has, has consequences. First of all, you know, in terms of the, you know, in terms of the ability of the masses to deliver a killer blow to the, to, to the regime, the depth, the much, much, much more dramatic development and self-organisation of the working class is, is, is necessary. Secondly, the fact that the focus of political action is on the streets imposes distortions. It encourages the idea among the most self-conscious revolutionaries that the electoral process is a farce, there's no difference, say, between SCAF and the Muslim Brotherhood, we should abstain from the whole thing, no elections under military rule, all sorts of stuff, stuff like that, which was a mistake, but not just was it a mistake, it had an influence, influence on the revolution, on the all, best, most self-conscious revolutionaries, on, for example, the revolutionary socialists. Because if you're, if, you know, the best revolutionaries are on the streets with the people who are fighting scab, so a lot of the radicalised younger youngsters join the revolutionary socialists, their mood, their moods, their sense that, you know, we can overthrow scab because we've seen through SCAF, we don't need elections because we've seen through, through elections, then uh, influences the organised revolutionaries and leads them to vacillate on whether to participate in the elections and, and so on and so forth. This is, you know, what I'm trying to say is that the kind of apparently very abstract analysis emphasising the privacy of politics and how all the contradictions of capitalist society are condensed in the political, and that means that the, at particular points the central front of struggle is not the one in the workplaces and so on. That is manifested in Egypt today, and it's tremendously important to un- understand that. You know, I hope comrades in Egypt. I mean, this is being, this is, I hope is going on. Will will end up on on YouTube. So I hope comrades in Egypt watch this and think about the relevance of our discussion, you know, they're in a much more advanced position, so they may decide it's completely irrelevant. But the experience of um, the um, of other other revolutionary movements is important. But also there are going to be other revolutionary experiences. You know, when um, I think the people who say that in Greece today we have an um, 
a, a movement that's comparable to the Portuguese Revolution in 1974-75, that's an exaggeration. You know, you had um, you had massive factory occupations, you had rank and file workers and rank and file soldiers, the soldiers armed and in uniform, marching through the streets together under revolutionary banners. Whatever's happened in Greece hasn't gone as far as that. But nevertheless, you know, we are in a period where that kind of development can't, can't be ruled out. And therefore, you know, what we get in Lenin is, um, to use his own phrase, a concentrated expression, theoretically articulated, of the greatest revolutionary experiences ever, of the high point of, of revolutionary struggles, full stop. Uh, and we need to, to use that, the, the understanding expressed in his career, in, in his writings, to help us grapple with what we're confronting today. And that's really what I've been trying to, trying to say. And I don't, I mean, you know, I agree with Marnie about Daniel Bensaid. I mean, you know, um, there will be comrades who say that I've got a uh, constitutional affinity for, um, uh, what shall I say, French, du politically dubious French philosophers, but it's not really <laughs> fair to compare Daniel to Althusser. I mean, Daniel was a consistent, determined, determined organised revolutionary from the age of 18 through to, through to his death. The kind of political choices that his tendency made weren't necessarily the choices that we've made. But I think there's, there's stuff to be learned from um, what, what he wrote. And one of the things that is strong in him is his focus on Lenin. You know, on the whole, Lenin isn't the kind of, the kind of thinker who philosophers like to celebrate, unless it's Zizek and, you know, it's, it's all mad bullshit. Um, <laughs> It is, really. I mean, what he writes about Lenin is not, not the best part of his work. Daniel writes very well about Lenin and understands not everything about Lenin, but, uh, but s some of the key things, and it's worth, worth learning from, from that. But I hope, I hope, I mean, I think it's been a very useful discussion, um, and comrades have explained probably much more clearly than me why the kind of approach, the kind of method I've been talking about is relevant to us in day. Uh, to us today, but I think that uh, it's connecting up the high point of the whole experience of revolutionary Marxism, as represented by Lenin in particular in the Russian Revolution, with what we're beginning to confront today, with what comrades in Egypt are confronting today, and others of us may have to confront. I think that's that's really important, and it's a test of Marxism. If Marxism, if the Marxist tradition can't speak in concrete ways to these new experiences, then, then we're wasting our time, our time, and anyone who, who listens to us is time. But I don't think we're are wasting our time, and that's why um, I think this course is quite, quite important. There are two other sessions, actually. There's one on Lenin's analysis, imperialism and revolution, and then the one on organisation. But in any case, thanks very much for a very interesting discussion. <laughs>